Amen. Thank you, Tom. If you would, take your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, we're uh, picking up. We stepped aside from Luke last week for Easter Sunday, and we're stepping back to uh, where we left off. In Luke chapter 7, we're going to look this morning in verses 36 down through verse number 50. Luke chapter 7, 36 through 50. As you're turning there, I'll just set the stage for what we're going to be looking at because in this passage of Scripture, we are confronted with uh, the most important thing for believers, for unbelievers, the most important commandment, the most important expectation of God for us, and that is a love for Jesus Christ, a love for God. If you were to look back in Mark chapter 12, uh, Jesus is approached by a lawyer. He's approached by one of the scribes, and the scribe comes to Jesus, and he asks him a question. He says, Teacher, tell us what is the foremost commandment? What is the most important commandment in the law of God? And Jesus, without hesitation, begins to quote for him, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind and all of your strength. This is the first and the greatest, the first and the most important commandment. So the, the most important thing for us this morning is that we love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. This is of first importance. If you go all the way to the book of Revelation, you find Jesus sending letters to the churches of Revelation, and one of those churches is the church of Ephesus, and in that letter to the church of Ephesus, he commends them for their deeds. He commends them for their toil and their hard work, their, their perseverance. He, he commends them that they won't tolerate evil, that they put to test people who call themselves apostles and yet are in reality false teachers. He commends them for their perseverance and their enduring through seeming persecution for his name's sake and, and that they've not grown weary in well-doing. But he said, I have this one thing against you. I have this one thing against you that you have left your first love. So all of these wonderful things that characterize the church of Ephesus are under a cloud and are under a shadow of the reality that they're working, yes, they're enduring, yes, they're being faithful, yes, they're believing truth, yes, they're standing up for truth, yes, but their love has grown cold. And Jesus says they need to remember from where they've fallen. They need to repent. They need to return to the way they were at the beginning. Or else, he says, I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, that lampstand represents the church. That lampstand represented the church at Ephesus. So here's what Jesus is saying to them. You may believe truth. You may know truth. You may stand for truth. You may persevere in the truth. You may endure suffering for my name's sake, but if you fall out of love with me, I will shut your church down. As we consider our scripture this morning in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, we need to ask ourselves, do we love Christ? How much do we love Christ? And what keeps us from loving him more? And since this is the most important thing, we need to ask ourselves, how can we cultivate yet a deeper love for Jesus? We get some insight in Luke chapter 7, let's begin in verse number 36. It says, Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he, Jesus, was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, standing behind Jesus at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Now, you have to get this picture. When people ate their meal in the Middle East, they didn't sit down at a, in a chair and they didn't sit down at a table and pull themselves up to eat like we do. No, what they would do is the table was down low and they would actually recline. They would lie down and they would put their weight upon one of their elbows and they would eat with the other hand. They were really close to the table that way, and they were just kind of leaned over the table eating. So Jesus is reclined here at this table. He's stretched out on his elbow. He has his feet out behind him, which is an open opportunity for this woman to kneel herself at his feet. 
And she begins, the Bible says, to wet his feet. She's weeping and she begins to wet his feet with her tears. In the Greek, that word wet literally means to rain. So get this picture. She's not just shedding a tear. She is raining tears down on the feet of Jesus. And the story goes on and she kept wiping them with the hair of her head. Now notice she is raining tears down on the feet of Jesus and she takes her hair and she begins to wipe the tears from Jesus' feet with her hair. This is absolutely amazing to consider because in the Old Test in the New Testament culture, in the Middle Eastern culture, for a woman to let her hair down in public was extremely, extremely shameful. For a woman to let her hair down in public would be grounds for divorce. Jewish ladies did not unbind their hair in public. But she was insensitive to cultural rules. She was insensitive to cultural expectations. And she took her hair down. And the Bible refers to a woman's hair as her glory. So she takes her very glory and she begins to wipe her tears from his feet. It goes on and says that not only was she wiping them with the hair of her head, but she was kissing his feet. And the Greek word there for kissing is the word kataphileo. And it's an intense word. And if you know the story of the prodigal son, when the prodigal son has gone away and his father's sitting on the porch and he's waiting for him, he's hoping for him to return. When that prodigal son finally comes home, it says that his father ran out to meet him. He embraced him and he kissed him. That's the picture that we have here of what this woman is doing to the feet of Jesus. It's a continual kissing and embracing and of, of this prodigal son. She's continually kissing and kissing and embracing his feet. So she kept wiping them with the hair of their head. She kept kissing his feet and then anointing them with the perfume. Many Jewish women carried around their necks a vial of perfume on a cord, which they kept with them all the time. Uh, it was sort of a deodorant. You know, they didn't have right guard or dove or whatever. So they carried this alibi, they carried this flask of perfume around their neck and they would kind of use that as a deodorant. It was not uncommon for women to spend a good portion of money on deodorant. I read one account where a man allowed in the family budget his wife 400 coins of gold, 400 gold coins each year to buy perfume. I don't know what he was trying to cover up, but apparently 400 it took 400 gold coins to cover up whatever he was trying to cover up in this lady. These women wore this deodorant, she, and she, didn't, she comes and she doesn't take the lid off of this flask. She breaks it. She doesn't pour the contents out. She spills them out upon Jesus' feet. This is a very unlikely, surprising scene that's happened here in this Pharisee's house for this sinful woman to have the audacity as with, with her reputation to walk into this Pharisee's house, kneel at the feet of this rabbi by the name of Jesus, shed tears upon his feet, wipe his feet with her very glory as she lets down her hair in public, kisses his feet and bursts her vial of perfume out upon his feet. Now look what happens in verse 39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what, what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Here we have that holier-than-thou attitude that characterizes the Pharisees. He's thinking to himself these hypocritical, judgmental thoughts. He won't say them out loud because he's a Pharisee. You know, he's too dignified. He's learned how to be religious. He's learned how to look the part. And in verse 40, Jesus answers him. He's, he's speaking to himself. Simon's talking to himself over here, and Jesus just answers him. And he says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged 
correctly. So Jesus shares a story with Simon the Pharisee in order to help him understand what he's trying to communicate. Imagine, Simon, that there's a man who loans money in town. And one man came and he borrowed from him 50 denarii. 50 denarii was about two months' pay, two months' salary. There's another man in town who comes and he borrows from him 500 denarii, which happens to be about 20 months' salary. Almost two years of, ent of his entire salary he borrows from this money lender. Now, the money lender finds out they can't repay, and in grace, he incurs the debt himself and says, I'm just going to let you guys off. I'm going to let you be free. I'm going to give you a receipt that your debt has been paid in full. Now, Simon, which one of these two people will love the money lender more? Which one of them is going to give him a five-star review on his website? Which one of these guys is going to tell all of his friends that this man is gracious? He'll do you right if you get in a bind. He won't come and treat you unjustly. In fact, he'll show unnecessary mercy and unbelievable grace. And Simon says, obviously, it's the guy who owed him almost two years of salary. He's going to love him more. He's going to be more excited over this. He's going to be more moved over this. And then in verse 44, turning towards the woman, he says to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, which was the normal hospitable thing to do for a guest. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet, which was a normal Middle Eastern greeting and still is, by the way, to kiss the cheek of the person. Verse 46, you did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, Simon, he who is forgiven little, loves little. What distinguished these two people was not what they did or did not do for Jesus, as much as their depth of love for Jesus. Don't miss that. What distinguished the sinful woman from the religious Pharisee was not so much what they did do or did not do, even for Jesus, but their depth of love for Christ. Simon's love for Christ climaxed with an invitation to come to his home without his feet being washed, without a kiss of greeting. This woman so loved Christ that she could not contain herself and she expresses it powerfully. And Jesus says, love is what made the difference. And love is what makes the difference. If love for Jesus Christ is of first and foremost importance, we need to ask ourselves this morning, why is it that we are so often like the church at Ephesus, and we are? Why are we so often like the church at Ephesus, guilty of leaving our first love guilty of growing cold in our love for jesus christ don't we need to ask ourselves why we so often have such little love for jesus and the simplest answer is given to us in verse 47 the reason we so often love little is because we have been forgiven little in our mind we think we've been forgiven little so we love little and that leads us to another question with a more complicated answer why would we have a little forgiveness? Why would we think we have been forgiven little? Is it because we're really pretty good people? You know, we were born to a Christian family. We grew up in church. We know the songs. We know the scriptures. We can find Hosea and Habakkuk in our Bibles pretty quickly. You know, we read our Bible. We pray. We put some money in the plates. We've been a pretty good person. Jesus, aren't you impressed with how good I have been? You've only had to forgive me a little. I'm not like the people who are hooked on drugs. I'm not like the people who are alcoholics. I'm not like the people who are, who are adulterers. I'm not like the people who are gamblers. I'm not like those, those people out there. You've only had to forgive me little. And when we have a view like that, that little forgiveness leads to little love. Now, why would we think we have a little forgiveness? There's three major reasons I want us to look at together this morning. Number one, we underestimate our sinfulness. That's why. We underestimate our sinfulness. As you read through the New Testament, you'll find out that every meal ever had with a Pharisee 
ends up in rebellious unbelief. Not one meal that Jesus shared with a Pharisee ended up with the Pharisee falling on his knees and saying, Oh, Jesus, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Every meal ever had with a Pharisee ends up in rebellious unbelief. Why? Because self-righteousness is a terrible, terrible kind of blindness. So if we have the mindset that I've been pretty good, I grew up in a religious home, I've done the right things, I've avoided more of the wrong things than most of those people out there. When we have that attitude of self-righteousness, it is a terrible blinder to the truth. Sooner or later, we'll get to Luke chapter 18, where Jesus tells a parable. And he tells a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. They think they're better than somebody else, spiritually, righteously, religiously. And he says that two men went up into the temple to pray. One happens to be a Pharisee. And the other was a tax collector. So he went from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum. You've got a Pharisee who dressed the part, who knew the scriptures, who kept the letter of the law, who wanted everyone else to keep the letter of the law that were looked at as the holier than thou people in the community. You go all the way down to the other end of the spectrum and you have a tax collector, which is the bottom of the barrel in Jewish first century life. A Pharisee and a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like this tax collector. He said, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Listen to what I do for you, God. I mean, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Aren't you proud of me? God but the tax collector was standing some distance away and he was unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven but he was beating on his chest saying God be merciful to me a sinner and who went home justified the tax collector went home justified and the Pharisee went home feeling great about himself but no closer to God the Pharisee underestimates his sinfulness we religious people often underestimate our sinfulness and the most unredeemable person of all is the one who thinks he's not really that bad of a sinner and he thinks he doesn't really need redemption he thinks God is pleased with him the way that he is so he marches he marches into church or he marches into the parking lot drives into the parking lot however you want to look at that in our context today he marches into the parking lot in his vehicle and he wants to hear this listen to what he or she wants to hear they want to hear how good they are They want to hear somebody tell them that everything's great. God's looking out for for them. God wants the best for them, and he does. But that's all they want to hear. They want to hear how God wants to dote upon them and how God wants to pour out his blessings upon them and how God wants to encourage them and how God loves them. and And all of these things are true, and they're great. But when we roll in with that attitude, it shows that we don't recognize that there's something deeper that God wants to deal with. And that is our holiness. Listen, God cares more about our holiness than our healthiness. God cares more about our holiness than our happiness. God cares more about our holiness than our wealthiness. God cares more about our holiness. So if we drive into church or walk into church and all we want to hear are accolades and hand claps and all of the easy things and appealing things about God, then it shows that we don't recognize we have something still that needs to be dealt with no matter how quote unquote good we are. The most unredeemable person is the one who doesn't realize how big of a sinner he is, how much he needs redemption, and who thinks God is just happy with him the way he is. And the reason we underestimate our sinfulness is because we measure ourselves by ourselves. I'm better than most people out there, preacher. I mean, look, I, during a pandemic, still am driving to church. I'm still watching online. I'm still sending in my tithes. I'm still reading my Bible. Look at our community. Look at the sin in our community. I'm not caught up in those things. Look at the sin in our state. 
Do you realize all of the things that the people in our state are doing right now that are sinful that, that I'm not doing? Look at our country and the shape it's in. I mean, every time I watch the news, every time I look around, I feel better about myself. And as long as we're measuring ourselves by people out there, and as long as we're measuring ourselves horizontally, as long as we're measuring ourselves by ourselves, we're going to underestimate our sinfulness every time. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 says, We are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some as those who commend themselves, but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. As long as we're looking horizontally, we will find ourselves without understanding. We need to stop measuring ourselves horizontally and start measuring ourselves vertically. Stop comparing ourselves to one another and start looking at the perfect standard of God who cannot look upon sin, which leads us to the second reason we feel like we have little forgiveness. We underestimate our sinfulness and we underestimate His holiness. Almost every time I talk to people about their salvation, their spiritual condition, it gets frustrating because everybody thinks they're okay. They make a case for their spiritual condition. You know, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I grew up in church. I was baptized. I'm a member of so-and-so church. I'm a pretty good person. Failing to realize that we, like this debtor in the story that Jesus told, are unable to pay, no matter how much good we do. We can't settle our sin debt no matter what or how much we do because we underestimate the holiness of the righteous God that we stand before. We underestimate the holiness and the standard of this God for us. We need to see His holiness. And I know that I've gone to Isaiah chapter 6 over and over again to show you the holiness of God. I know that I've gone to Revelation 4 and 5 over and over again to show you the holiness of God. So I'm not going to take you back there this morning. I'm going to take you somewhere else. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 1. Now, you know when the pastor says turn to Ezekiel, anything can happen, right? If you've read Ezekiel, you know that anything can happen. We're going to keep it safe, and we're going to look at chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 4 through 14 first. And I want you, to the best of your ability, as we read this together, I want you to envision in your mind's eye what Ezekiel is seeing and what he is attempting to describe for us. Picture this in your mind's eye, and let's recognize this morning that this is the God that we stand before today and that we will stand before one day. In Ezekiel 1 and verse 4, it says, As I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north. A great cloud with fire flashing forth continually and a bright light around it. And in its midst, something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. So here's a storm cloud brewing and it's coming for Ezekiel. And it's like a fire and it's flashing light continually and it's surrounded by bright light. And in the midst of this storm cloud, is, it's like metal has been heated up to to glowing hot temperature. And within it, within the storm cloud, there were figures resembling four living beings. And this was their appearance. They had human form. That means their bodies looked sort of like a human. And each of them had four faces and four wings. So they had a face straight a face and back a face to the left a face to the right and they had four wings one in front one behind and two on the sides that's the picture that i get looking at this four faces four wings verse seven their legs were straight and their feet were like a calf's hoof and they gleamed like burnished bronze and under their wings on their four sides were human hands as for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another and their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. So I picture this box. It's almost like a square and their wings are touching each other to make this square where all of the creatures are connected and they don't turn their bodies to move. They move in straight lines because they have a face facing each way. There's no turning 
They're just moving straight forward. And in verse 10, it says, as for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. So looking forward, there's a face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right side and the face of a bull on the left side, and all four had a face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching another being and two covering their bodies. And each went straight forward wherever the spirit was about to go. They would go without turning as they went. Now, in the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire. So in the midst of this square that these beings in this glimmering, shining cloud make, is something like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright, and lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. We haven't even gotten to God yet. This is just the precursor. This is the, this is the pre-show. Can you imagine these beings? Let's drop down to verse number 26, not 22 as in your notes, but down to verse 26. And let's see who these beings proceed. Above the expanse that was over their heads, there was something, something resembling a throne. So here's this expanse, and these creatures are in the midst of this expanse. They've got Ezekiel captivated. He can't look away until he sees above the expanse, over their heads, something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli. That's what the NASB says. Your translation may say sapphire. This is like lapis lazuli in appearance, or, sapphire, or deep blue sapphire in appearance. So imagine this throne, something like a throne, that is deep blue like a sapphire. And on that, which resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. Then I noticed from the appearance of his loins and upward something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like fire. And there was a radiance around him as the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And I can only imagine that Ezekiel, even under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, had a very, very, very difficult time explaining this heavenly scene. And I can imagine that as I read it to you this morning and try my best to unfold it for you this morning, that I'm doing a very terrible, terrible job of conveying that accurately as to what Ezekiel saw. And as you hear, I, I believe that you are probably hearing in a very, very, very pitiful way what Ezekiel saw. When we get from what Ezekiel saw to his pen, to my lips, to your ears, we don't even have a, a, an, an image of what glory he saw. How would we respond if we could get past our ears and my lips and Ezekiel's pen and actually see what Ezekiel saw? I think we would respond as he responded at the very end of verse 28. When I saw it, I fell on my face. We wouldn't take a selfie with this one and post it on Facebook. We wouldn't take a selfie with this one and put it on Instagram. We wouldn't hashtag cool morning at church. We would be on our face. And I want you to know this morning that as we drive into this parking lot, as we log in online and watch this live, that this is the God that we stand before this morning. This is the God we sing before this morning. This is the God that we live before. This is Him. He's not lesser because we can't see Him. He's not lesser because we can't understand Him. He is this God of Isaiah 6, Revelation 4, Ezekiel 1. And if we catch a glimpse of this God, we will see our sinfulness with much more clarity. We sang in the first song, we sang the last verse. says, Great Father of glory, pure Father of light, thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All praise we would render, oh, help us to see, tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. That's what we see in Ezekiel 1. And we see the holiness of God. And we see our sinfulness more clearly. When we, when we analyze our sinfulness vertically rather than horizontally, here's what we may be tempted to do. And this is what some of you leave with because you don't get past this. Week after week, I hear it from you. You don't get past this point. You miss the last point. And the last point is we not only underestimate our sinfulness because we underestimate God's holiness we also have a little forgiveness because we underestimate God's forgiveness. 
You can't see the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace and the love and the compassion of God if all you hear every time you tune in to your favorite preacher or every time you pull up to church is how wonderful you are. Yes, that will fill up the pews. Yes, that will fill up the parking lot. Yes, that will fill up your, your likes on Facebook. But that will not fill up your soul. We have to see our sinfulness in light of God's holiness and we are brought to the depths of despair and frustration and aggravation and feel like we can't, we're hopeless and we're helpless and that is when we turn to see God's great forgiveness. Don't underestimate His forgiveness. If you leave here frustrated because you hear of the holiness of God and our sinfulness every week, then it's because you are still underestimating the forgiveness that is available in Christ Jesus. Some of you think my sin is too big, my sin is too great, it's been too long, and God could never forgive me. Well, I know I've told this a thousand times, and if I can think of something better, I guess I'll keep telling it. But I want you to imagine with me again Jesus on that cliff. If you've heard this before, just listen again. Imagine Jesus on that cliff. With his back to the, to, the, to the cliff where it plummets off into the ocean. And the tide in that ocean is going out to sea. And you approach Jesus this morning. You've been, you've been in this place and you have seen your sinfulness. You have seen his holiness. You've caught a glimpse. Imagine yourself going to Jesus and giving him your sin. Whatever that sin is you think he can't forgive. Whatever that sin is, you can't get free from. Whatever that sin is, you can't find peace in. Whatever that sin is that you think is too big, too old, been going on too long, bring it to Jesus. Confess your sin. See your sin as he sees it. Repent of your sin. Give that to Jesus. And what will he do with it? Jesus will take that sin and he will cast it on the ground and he will crush it underneath his feet. He will pick your sin up after crushing it under his feet, and he will throw it behind his back. And as that sin goes behind Jesus' back, it will plummet off the cliff, and it will go into the very depths of the sea. And as the tide goes out, it will take your sin with it as far as the east is from the west, and Jesus will wipe his hands and remember it, hold it against you no more, and there will be no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. That's exactly what he does. Micah 7, 19. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Isaiah 38, 17. You cast all my sins behind your back. Micah 7, 19. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Jeremiah 31, 34. I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember them, their sin no more. Listen to me. If you leave this place discouraged, it's because either one, you have tuned out before you've gotten to the end of the message, or two, you you are still underestimating the power of Jesus Christ to forgive. Because when we see our sinfulness in light of His holiness, and then we see that in spite of that, in spite of that, there is great forgiveness in Jesus Christ. How do you leave discouraged? Unless you refuse to repent. Unless you refuse to believe. How do you leave discouraged when you see the forgiveness of Jesus? See your sin in light of His holiness. See His great forgiveness available to all who believe. And if you do, He will say to you what He said to that woman in verse 48. He said to her, Your sins have been what? Forgiven. Now, did she walk out of there going, Man, I'm such a horror. I just, I've blown it with my life. I just wish I could go back and undo the things I've done. God, I'll just do some penance. I'll do penance the rest of my life. I'll cover myself in sackcloth. I'll cover myself in ashes because I know what Jesus said. I know what the Bible says, but I just don't believe it. It's not enough. Is that how she left? He said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And we know that based upon her love for Christ, she knew it. She believed it. She embraced it. 
And those who are reclining at the table with him, oh, they're still on their holy high horse. They've got their seminary degrees, and they know this doesn't line up with, with theology 101. How can this man, they say, even forgive sin? Let's strain at the gnat, swallow the camel, and miss the Messiah. Because of our theological education, Pharisees. Who is this man who even forgives sin? And in verse number 50, he said to the woman, look at what he said, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It was not her tears from a broken heart that saved her. It was not her humble ministry as she let down her hair and wiped his feet that saved her. It was not her sacrificial service as she anointed his feet with oil that saved her. It was her faith in the work of and the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ that saved her and gave her peace. Listen to me. Here's what you need this morning. If you have seen your sinfulness in light of his holiness and you believe that he is able to forgive, you need not penance. You don't need works. You don't need to bust out your perfume. You don't need to shed a lot of tears, though that's okay. You don't need to let down your hair and wipe his feet. You need to believe. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace, through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. You can have a big forgiveness this morning which will result in a big love for Jesus Christ today if you will just by faith bring your sin to Jesus. And he will crush them under his feet, throw them behind his back, cast them into the depths of the sea, take them as far as the east is from the west, and he will remember them no more. That's what he came to do. That's what he came to accomplish for me and for you, to be a mediator, to bridge the gap between the holiness of God in Ezekiel 1 and the sinfulness of me and you, and to become our mediator, the atonement for our sin, the payment for our sin, to incur our debt, and all of us owe more than we could ever pay to pay that price for us on the cross, to rise from the grave on Sunday morning so that we can be reconciled to God and forgiven and made a new creation. Would you this morning see your sinfulness? Would you see God's holiness? Would you believe that he can forgive you? If so, by faith, turn from your sin, put him at his feet, and believe in what he did for you on the cross. And you will be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love. Thank you for these people that are here this morning. For their willingness to come. For their willingness to part. For their willingness to listen. For their willingness to turn on the computer and be intentional about sitting in front of it. And paying attention and taking notes. For their willingness to be here in spirit or in body. We thank you for that. We pray that you've spoken. We pray that you would work. We pray that we would respond as you would see fit for us to respond this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.